harvest. Harvest. Look, timber, they mine, Russian meat. The Russians don't have nearly enough enforcement. You put military or police to maintain a border that big. Yeah. It's too big. It's 11 times. Yeah. So, and the Chinese just are in there all the time taking everything that's good valuable. Yeah. And there's not a thing, and that's why China's always yeah. kind of on their side. Yeah. Right, you know what I mean? It's a very strange relationship. Yeah. But Putin and the Tsar, when, when the Tsar is extended the empire out of the Pacific Ocean yeah. that far, they didn't have any way to enforce those borders either. Yeah. You can't have enough army people to, to yeah. defend a border that big, particularly bordering on these Islamic countries. Yeah. And, Kazakhstan and China and like yeah. well, it's just a wild west show. Yeah. Yeah, no, they don't. No way. What's the name? Uh, this, he was like a what was that? Faith healer. He he was different. I don't remember. Rescued. Yeah. <laughs> Not rescued. Not rescued. No, okay. Said <laughs> faith healer just came to mind. Yeah. How you doing, Al? Good. How are you? Okay. Sorry, I missed last week. Yeah, hey, it's okay. Love a makeup session over here. Uh, send me a note or something. Well, they're recording it, so if you really want to suffer through a recording. Have they sent us the record, uh, recording link yet? We're going to put it up on some website somewhere where you can just go. I'm not sure. I don't know how long that's going to happen. You're going to wait until you're all done, though. Yeah, wait. Yeah. Thomas. Welcome back, Mr. B. Hey, I saw you the other day. I mean, I got a chance to say hello. Back in town, Marquise. Yes. How's it going, Randy? Good. How you doing? Where'd you guys go? Are you alive? Well, they told me you were gone. Well, we left for a week. Sure, 60 degree weather would empty this place out. <laughs> hey guys.
So was everybody, how many people were here last time? Last, wow, okay, great. So last time, um, we sort of ended where uh, uh, Gorbachev had uh, tried to do two things that were in total conflict. He was trying to save the old communist system, but reform it and create some semblance of private ownership and free enterprise and things and having businesses open up for profit, but still totally maintaining um, a communist system. And the more that that didn't work, the more he kind of unloosened the screws on the central planning. Remember that it were forever, uh, Soviet Union had been the ultimate centrally planned uh, economy. And he started loosening up the central, you know, central planning apparatus, and dele having dele delegate more of those decisions about where the budgets go and all that to either factory owners or uh, republic governors or whatever. But what he didn't do was the first thing he should do is put some semblance of of laws in place that every government who has a free enterprise system has laws that govern how that works. Um, and that, that was never done. There was never, remember, any notion of uh, ownership of property or you know what it meant, or there's no institutionalized court system for resolving conflicts. So it was a free for all. And when you've got a big vacuum like that with no laws and you're messing with an existing autocratic system and you start to loosen it up and reform it, but there's no laws that are enforceable or even written down yet, somebody steps into the void and those are usually called criminals, <laughs> right? I mean, that's nothing new about that. Russian didn't invent that. So anyway, we kind of left it there, but I thought I'd, start with, uh, so anyway, so we're gonna, um, our wild and crazy guy, Boris Yeltsin there, uh, who drank copious amounts of vodka, uh, he started his own privatization program. The difference now is that the Soviet Union itself is gone. And the last thing we did was we just dissolved the Soviet Union and uh, we created 14 new countries, uh, the Ukraine and 13 other ones that were sovereign countries that used to be Russian republics overnight. So that's where we are now. And, uh, but I thought, you know, so we're gonna be talking about crime all night, okay? <laughs> There's just no way to get around it. It's, you know, it's either gangsters or politicians or oligarchs or whatever. And it's just one giant uh, uh, story about uh, criminality. So I try to lighten it up here and there, but it's hard to do. So, but but speaking of uh, okay, this isn't good. Okay, there we go. Um, like a lot of these things go back to the beginning of the communist experiment. Uh, you also talked to you last time about uh, Vladimir Putin, I'm sorry, about Vlad, um, Vladimir Lenin and how he uh, made a lot of lip service to creating sort of a elected system of what were called Soviets. Remember, these were like elected town halls, town councils and where workers and peasants would have direct control over their lives. All the while, he's plotting to build this militant, you know, communist system. So if we're gonna talk about crime, we gotta go there because that's where this whole uh, culture of criminality really begins with, with Lenin. So I just as a little, little quiz. So uh, this is, this is about 1907, you could describe, I'm, I'm trying to describe a, a man here, a person here who robbed banks, ran uh, protection rackets, rackets, 
Uh, well, you know, he had, he was a pirate. He robbed trains. He did all this stuff. And these are this this gangster is where all the money came from that let the Bolsheviks fight their war, their civil war after they overthrew the Tsarist government. Um, and but he was this this man was not only a great source of revenue through piracy and just about every crime you could commit. Um, he was also a really savvy political organizer. All this started when the Tsar was still in power, Nicholas II. Uh, he's got people infiltrating the Tsar's security services. And uh, he was this interesting combination. He was an intellectual, he'd actually gone to seminary, but he was a cold blooded killer. And it's exactly what Vladimir <clears throat> Lenin needed um, in 1917. Uh, to kind of, you know, run, run the show. Who am I talking about? Who is the man who in the 1910, 19, all the way to 1920 was really running this gigantic uh, criminal enterprise for Lenin? No, it's this guy. Does that give you a hint? Who is that guy? No, how about this? Does he start to look familiar now? That's uh, Joseph Stalin. And uh, from, like, like I say, way before the actual Bolshevik revolution, uh, Stalin was, uh, he grew up in uh, Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia. That's a police rap sheet from Baku, uh, Azerbaijan. He, 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 he did his thing down in the Caucasus by the Black Sea, uh, where Again, Georgia, as you know, all those uh, those countries that are countries now. Um, and he was he was the he was the muscle, uh, the mafia kind of muscle behind the whole Bolshevik re revolution. So th th this culture starts with Stalin, and he, of course, after Lenin dies in 1824, uh, he's his only competition at that point was Trotsky. Trotsky, somebody mentioned Trotsky. Trotsky was sort of the ideologue, but he's the muscle. And anyway, so this is kind of where our criminal story begins. You gotta start with Stalin, because, and, and I keep recommending this book to you, The Young Stalin, which documents how he went from a seminary student <laughs> to this. Um, it's a great story. You, you can't make it up, it's a great, it's a great movie. I don't know why somebody hasn't made it. Okay, so, now, fast forward to um, kind of where we left off, where Gorbachev's capitalism, that experiment in capitalism was created without any, in, in this vacuum, without any laws or institutions created. And for people that did take him up on his uh, economic program, where you could start a member of cooperative and you could create a cooperative in your city making some commodity that you couldn't buy from the state store. I think I use the example of in Russia, every kid needs really good winter boots and you couldn't get them <laughs> from the government unless they had quotas for your town because it was all centrally controlled. But now he would, you could set up your own little enterprise with some other folks in your town and fill a gap and make boots for kids. I mean, that was the idea. Problem is, um, there's no laws, there's no police um, protecting you from uh, the, the kind of criminals that, that are starting to run rampant here. So these new cooperative owners um, have to start doing what happens you know, in every mafia story, which is you buy protection from somebody. There's somebody who's gonna offer you protection from uh, the criminals down the street that that drop into your store every Tuesday afternoon and need money from you for protection money, right? That's age old system, been around forever. So again, I just keep harping on this, but this is allowed to start and the black market around this begin. There's no markets 
<laughs> there's no market regulations. There's no formal way to sell commodities or do anything like the markets the way we think of them. So everything becomes a black market immediately because there's, there's nothing else. Um, and while this is starting up in the uh, late 80s, um, in 92, now Yeltsin is in charge. He, he's in charge um, 91. And the other thing that goes on that, um, <clears throat> remember the old Soviet Union just a year before had collapsed. So do we need a KGB anymore, right? The secret police, you don't need a KGB, right? <laughs> so KGB staff is reduced down to almost nothing. Um, 25,000 army officers from the Red Army, and there is no Red Army anymore, remember? It, nobody thought about what would happen to the army when you dissolve the Soviet Union. Now you've got a bunch of officers and soldiers scattered all over 14 new countries that used to be in Russia yesterday. And a whole bunch of them, and I think we mentioned it last week, where I mean, you can say what you want about the e efficacy of the Red Army through time, but they're loyal. They are patriots to the communist cause in the, in the in Soviet Union. And now they're on the street. And not only are they unemployed, um, they are vilified because they're communists. So one night you're a, a, a card carrying communist and you've got power and prestige and everything. And the next minute, uh, Communist Party is outlawed, and you've got a Communist Party membership card in your pocket, which is not only worth nothing to you in terms of your old power, what you, you know, the privileges you may have had as a party member. And now it's worth nothing, and everybody hates you because you're a communist. So, and then, so a whole bunch of army officers are, are fired, 70,000 police are fired for corruption. Now, what happens to the weapons of all these people? Is there any program to recover the weapons of all the soldiers and the KGB guys and the, and the police that have now just hit the street unemployed with nothing to do, no income, no nothing, right? This is a lot of <coughs> trained people and they're unemployed and they have weapons because nobody confiscated any of their weapons and not to mention that, but the old interior ministry were the only government agency that was hired to fight organized crime. And again, most of those folks are now in the same position as these others. And they just switch sides, right? They, they instead of fighting against organized crime, they just join organized crime. I mean, you gotta buy bread, you gotta, gotta live, you gotta feed your kids. And again, there is no underlying infrastructure here, law, government, anything that protects anybody now. It's just open season. So this is the, the kind of state of things. So we got off to a real bad start here after the fall of the Soviet Union. And so in this side of the world, we call this the mafia, the Sicilian mafia. And, and, the, and the model of say the Sicilian family kind of mafia system is very much the same. I mean, you can't innovate it much more than that. <laughs> it is. Now in Russia, they're not, they're called the, uh, the word vor is the word for thief in Russian. Vori is just plural. So, you know, people interchange mafia for Vori, but in Russian, it's the Vori. Um, we're right out of the gate, way back in Gorbachev's time when he started uh, re removing the central controls of, of the old communist government. And this black market flourishes all over the country. They get right in there, and they are now the the protection. Most of these people used to be police. They used to be, and and, and this is also the time when um, the their Afghanistan war was just ending. So now you've got a bunch of. Uh, mainly enlisted veterans who just walked out of a meat grinder in, in Afghanistan. And they've been through every possible horror you could ever subject a, a soldier to. And yet, I mean, we went through our version of it, but this was worse, I guess. And again, they're just now part of the protection racket. 
that if you're still holding on to your small business or your collective and you've got a whole bunch of neighborhoods and there's nothing different about this than you know michael corleone owning the you know running the olive oil business <laughs> in the movies um everybody needs protection from either the gang down the street and so you do a deal with the gang on your street i mean it's just classic and the guys that are running these protection rackets are snapping up business here and real estate because it's all being privatized right so if you've got enough money you can buy or make a business or, or if you've got a bunch of protection money come in illegally um, you can use that protection money to invest in real estate and to start to uh, create a criminal organization that is acquiring assets illegally, but they're acquiring assets. And to the extent that they start to go a little professional, right? So now they're putting bigger, we call them corporations, it's a little early to call these businesses corporations, but what were a couple of years ago, state owned enterprises like an oil refinery state owned or whatever um now the criminal organizations are taking these things over and they're putting their own guys on the boards of directors of these businesses including and most importantly to the banks so they are now you're finding the criminal element infiltrating the banks in 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 russia and that's a really important move because that's really the seed where the oligarchs start, if you will. So by 1993, we're only two years in, um, almost all the banks are one way or another owned, owned by the, uh, I'll just say mafia, just to use our word. And about 80% of businesses are paying protection money to somebody. And it is just what you think is gonna happen. Um, it's, it's just murder incorporated, right? There's just these street gangs, shootouts in downtown Moscow. Uh, it, I mean, it's kind of like what I think of the Al Capone thing where you see all those, all the stuff from the thirties where all these mafia gangs and all these gangsters are killing each other and, and you know, the latest Italian restaurant, they're all in. You know, it's just like that, except it's in Moscow and it's out of control. So I, I, just a, a, a kind of a funny, this is the late, Part I mentioned, I promised. Mm -hmm. So these guys are these criminals are a piece of work. So when they die or get killed, um, <laughs> they create these. This is the tombstone of a couple of the mafia guys from I think it was St. Petersburg. That that those. That, you know, <laughs> cost about $400,000 in dollars to make that. But these guys are loaded. And so when they die, they build these monuments to themselves, showing the really cool, fancy cars they've got. And uh, I mean, this is so in your face. It's just, you've got to love it, right? I mean, and like, here's another one, right? Here's a couple guys and their tombstones. Next to the car, you know, next to the cool Mercedes that, that he had when he got killed or when he died, when, who knows who. And then this guy, I love this guy with the really fancy wine. And there's a, there's a cemetery <laughs> in a town outside of Moscow where all these guys are buried. And it's acres of this stuff, <laughs> of, of these monuments to, well, there it is. I, mean, well, I don't know what you, now this one really, this is the last one, but I really wonder about this one. So what the hell's going on with these women? So <laughs> this is one now is, and I can't figure it out. Is this the wife and a daughter? Because they also built these to their families. Problem is they have different last names. Wife and mistress? I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, <laughs> inquiring minds want to know what's what. <laughs> what's the deal with this? You know, this tomb with these. You know, and I. There's no. Re I couldn't find any answer to that question, but. Anyway, so these guys are, does this tell you something about the criminals that are running the show now? <laughs> I mean, it's, you can't, so anyway, that was the light, the light part of this presentation, okay. <laughs>
Um, <clears throat> but I thought it was hilarious. I stumbled on it the other night. I thought I was seeing it. I mean, I don't think Italian mafia didn't do that. I mean, who does that? OK, so now we're going to get into um, this death spiral of Boris Yeltsin's making. And I, I kind of started, maybe this is not going to work, but summarizing it instead of summarizing it at the end, I want to summarize it at the beginning because it's a little convoluted and probably a little complicated to go through it all. But um, when, when Yeltsin starts to develop government policies to implement um, his version of capitalism, in this wild west town <laughs> called Russia. Um, here's just the sort of uh, chronology we're gonna go through next. So uh, the first thing he does is he takes all the price controls off. He takes the price controls off a totally planned centralized economy, which was subsidized for 70 years without, there was no market, there was no notion of what the value of something is, it's all subsidized. When you take the lid off of that and you just remove all the price controls, what happens? Hyperinflation happens. 2000% hyperinflation happens. So that was a that great start. Then we're gonna go through this thing about privatization vouchers in 92. And that is where, and that's the next sort of slide here, but every about 140 million citizens in Russia got a, a voucher in the mail that was worth 10,000 rubles. And the idea was you could now buy, you could use that free money. It's here, here's 10,000, no strings attached. You can use this thing, this piece of paper worth 10,000 rubles and you can buy a car. I don't, we don't care, but what, you, what we want you to do is to invest it in these newly privatized companies that are now selling this stuff called stock. Does anyone know what stock is yet? This is, you know, I mean, none of these, there's no foundation for any of this where people were actually buying stock interest ownership in companies, but that's, yeah, that was the intent. And we'll get to that next. But then after that, uh, there's this thing called loans for share program in 95. Um, and that's really where the oligarchs uh, ran the table, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And then the next big thing, which is gonna influence a whole bunch of crazy stuff, including how Vladimir Putin uh, rode this wave. Uh, in, in 96, Boris Yeltsin's up for re-election, and we'll get what that <laughs> means. And what, that, what happened there is most prof profitable in the big industries, oil, mining, uh, uh, media, TV stations um, are auctioned off uh, to the oligarchs now. And then those oligarchs in turn get Bor uh, Yeltsin reelected. We'll get into why that was a corrupt thing, but it's a prid, prid quo quo. Yel Yeltsin says, I'll give you this oil company if you support my re-election. And that's exactly what happened. And then um, at the end of this kind of crazy story, then the oligarchs are gonna pick, pick, uh, pick Putin as the prime minister because by um, the late nineties, uh, the heavy drinking has gotten up, gotten, a, gotten Yeltsin in pretty bad shape and they knew they, they'd have to find a successor. And, We'll figure out why Putin was selected as the prime minister who would then succeed Yeltsin when he stepped down. So anyway, that, that's just kind of a roadmap that I wanted to just kind of give you the 50,000 foot roadmap. We're going to go, now we're going to drill down into some of this a little more. And again, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Could they tell who you voted for? I mean, were people scared to vote the wrong way? That do you know what I'm asking? Uh, no, but there's no voting going on here yet. Oh, okay. But you said he got reelected, but that's not. Yeah, no, but wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, we'll, we'll get to that. That was, yeah. Um, but I don't think it wasn't what you're thinking. Okay. 
it wasn't like you're going to be on the wrong side of somebody if you vote against Yeltsin. Okay, thank you. So this is old, kind of old data, but there's two um, oligarchs we're going to kind of zero in here. There's a whole bunch of them, but these two really ha have the best story, I think. Uh, now, again, this data is kind of old. First of all, if you think back, in, like, this is about circa 19, 2017, and I couldn't find any 2020 data that made any sense to me, so I just kept this, but uh, it's, it's still relevant, I think. The Russian Federation, the gross domestic product of the Russian set of, so the whole Russian Federation was in, in 2017 about $1.7 trillion, something on the order of Italy, not even as big as California. And you, you, know, you guys know that kind of thing, right? I mean, it's not that big a deal. But um, the billionaires back then were worth about $500 billion. And if you think about $500, $500 billion, in the oligarchs hand their wealth and the GDP of the entire company, the country is 1.7 trillion. You kind of see who's running, who's got the money. You know. and so anyway, we'll get into Khodorovsky and, and Berezovsky too here in a minute. So that's just a, you know. So here's this uh, voucher program. And this is a check that you would get in the mail uh, one fine day and it says, uh, you know, privatization check, 10,000 rubles. And the idea, if you looked at the, um, the intent, uh, is to create a middle class of small property owners who would be the foundation for a democratic Russia. Now, I have to say, be, before we get into this, really, at the beginning of Yeltsin's uh, program for creating a uh, free enterprise based democratic <coughs> Russia, the economy particularly, he had two choices as soon as he was elected. And I sat around and said, well, the right thing to do is to go slow. Don't do this too fast. Don't make um, Gorbachev's mistake and jump right to policy when you don't have a legal system yet, <laughs> when you don't have policy yet when you don't have laws governing things like <coughs> property ownership or any of these things, right? Take five years and put the legal infrastructure in place. Then start rolling out policy once you've got that and you've got a working judiciary where grievances can be hammered out and a, a judiciary. I don't, a, we don't have a judiciary yet. So that was the recommendation from almost everybody was, Boris, do this first. Don't do stuff like this first, because nobody's going to know what you're talking about. You give them 10,000 rules, and there's no law saying how this is going to work, and there's no. But he doesn't do that. He, he, his word for the alternative to going slow was shock therapy. No, we're going to. To him, in his mind, the clock was ticking. He didn't have time to do it right and put all the institutional stuff in place first because, okay, maybe the Soviet Union's gone and maybe you know, all that, but there's a bunch of hardliners and, and people that very much want all this to fail and they, they still are plotting to go back to the old Soviet Union. There's a whole bunch of people that have not given up yet on the Soviet Union. I mean, it only happened 24 months ago. And so far, it ain't going so well. So there's a huge movement underneath the, the currents here to um, depose Yeltsin. Man, it's a coup they're plotting. Again, they already tried that once. It failed. They're going to do it again and, <laughs> and just go right back into um, the, you know, the old communist uh, system. And that, I mean, yours knows these people are plotting this right now. So he says, I don't have time. If I don't do this stuff now, this, this big reform privatization effort now, um, they're going to stage a coup and we're going to lose. So we have to do this now. Shock therapy is the way we're going. So that's what we chose. That's what he chose to do. So again, this, this 10,000 rubles is meant to hopefully um, 
buy stock, buy ownership shares in brand new companies or old line state owned industries like the oil industry or the gas industry or whatever, okay? So most of the people that are running those old state industries, well, we're gonna use a, we're gonna do a case study here of, of Gazprom, which was the world's largest natural gas supplier anywhere in the world. And, um, and see how that went because they were uh, obliged to issue stock and have people buy shares in that in Gazprom and use their 10,000. Because you remember, if, if every person in the family got 10,000 rubles and you got a family of six, that's not, at the time, the, the value of those rubles is pretty, pretty good. You could buy stuff, with it, including shares. So, but um, of course, the company management, you're still the old timers. It's not like we have some new generation of enlightened businessmen yet, business people. Um, we still have the old company management, the old, you know, and so they create what are called closed joint stock companies, which I'm not a finance guy. So I, I try to look it up, but it's really where I think uh, management decides that they're going to keep their shares within the employee base of their company and the management base. They're not necessarily going to just offer up ownership to the general public, which never is the main idea here. But most companies don't want to do that. I mean, they don't want to, why should they share through dividends, for example, the company's profits with people they don't know? I mean, that's how it works here. But if you're them, you're going to say share profits with these, you know, no, I, we don't, and again, there's no law saying, there's no laws yet, right? So you can, you can close your company off to these, in, these investments. And so nothing changes really in these management structures in these big companies, even in small companies too. And uh, modernization of those industries doesn't happen. Uh, the workers keep their old jobs. The management kind of hunkers down, keeps their old jobs. They don't want to give up any privilege to stockholders, whatever they are. And so, and of course, there's not even a twinkle in the eye yet of something called foreign investment in any of this stuff which ideally you'd like to attract foreign investors and right, capitalize your company and make improvements and all that. Um, so uh, that's sort of how this was set up. And the, you, know, you can see the intent was interesting, but the on the ground reality, and here's the, here's the sort of gas from example, I guess, case study, right? So uh, they are the biggest, Maybe they still are, I don't know, uh, biggest producer of natural gas in the world. Uh, so they, like all of all the big ones, all the big industries, rigged their auction, right? The idea was uh, you take your, your 10,000 ruble voucher and, and there would be an auction where you, they would auction off assets and ownership to the general public. But in the, in the gas problems, the state, the, the, the public could only buy shares if you got on an airplane and flew to this little Siberian village near the Arctic, where all the gas, depart, gas, gas departments deposits are. Now, Gazprom has offices all over Russia, but you can't go there. The, the rule that some guy at Gazprom says, well, you, we're not going to let you participate in the, in the stock option, uh, auction thing, unless you travel to this little village in Siberia, <clears throat> then you can do it. <clears throat> Gazprom doesn't want any individual, some, some grandma with 10,000 ruble vouchers saying, hey, buy one, three shares of Gazprom. They don't want that. And, and I don't think she's going to fly to Siberia to get it. And even if she does, a lot of the uh, runways were blocked off so airplanes couldn't even land on the runways. I mean, they, this is like, but again, why not? Is there, any, is there any penalty for doing this? Is there any penalty for 
subverting this 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 program of, of uh, investing in newly privatized companies. No, there's no law. There's no nobody going to stop you. And of course, the, these old communist directors buy up all the shares themselves, um, and they create uh, these things they euphemistically call export trading companies. These are offshore kind of middlemen companies associated with Gazprom that are somewhere incorporated offshore somewhere. And that's where, and again, you couldn't do this in the communist days, but now anything goes. So any cash revenue or any profits that you're getting now in this new world, you can immediately say, well, we're, we're gonna invest in the pipeline division of our export trading company in, I don't know, Italy, I mean, wherever. All of that is just a way to get profits out of Russia and in offshore bank accounts. And so none of them, none of the money that's being generated by Gazprom is being plowed back into Gazprom to fix their old equipment or to drill new wells or any of that. They've got this, they've already got a, a uh, offshore kind of middlemen uh, structure they're building to accumulate their cash and keep it away from the government. Because taxes haven't really kicked in yet. And if, even if they did, they wouldn't, nobody pay them. Why would you? There's no penalty for not paying your taxes yet. Um, so Gazprom is privatized in 1994 and the value on the, I'll use the word market loosely, is 250 million American dollars. The, the price is at, in, in later in 1997 when it was actually um, put on the international stock exchanges. The real value of Gazprom was 40 billion dollars, but it was privatized in 94 for 250 million dollars. So if you're one of those old communist directors, you're you know you're the CEO of Gazprom Incorporated. Um, you now own a $40 billion company where before the government owned the company <laughs> and when it was sort of privatized in 84, the market said, well, it's only worth 250 million. I mean, if you want to know where billion, like, oligarch types come from, they come from buying assets illegally really um, for such dramatically undervalued prices that I mean, anybody who knows anything about the gas industry in the world knows Gazprom is like the best company in the world. I mean, in terms of, I mean, they've got the best fields in Siberia and, you know, $40 billion. By the way, Putin knows almost 5% of it. Of course he does. And while this is going on, government has collecting no taxes. There's no re reinvestments being made in the company or in Russia. Ideally, you would be plowing money back in to improve, if there was a government functioning, to improve the infrastructure in Russia, right? I mean, corporations don't pay a lot. I mean, I don't know if they, how much taxes they would have paid, but if there was a system for collecting taxes, you would plow it back in and, and, and build new infrastructure with that money, but that can't happen yet. So anyway, that's one kind of case study. So we talked about hyperinflation. Um, this is the other thing going on at exactly the same time as this voucher program. So in 91, when they issued those that vouchers, 10,000 rubles would buy you about that much of a, so a, a Russian-made car, about 60% of a car. So if the family pooled their money, their 10,000 ruble checks, you could actually buy a car, a real car. And... Um, I mean, that, that had never happened. Nobody had ever owned a car because there was no such thing as private ownership in the communist days. So, but that's 91. That's when the value of 10,000 rubles would get you a car. Well, when hyperinflation is rolling along at about 2,000%, in 93, that 10,000 rubles is worth 180 rubles. You can buy three bottles, bottles of vodka with, instead of a car. Okay, so this hyperinflation thing is, is just killing people's whatever savings they have. 
uh, they're not investing in companies. They're not buying cars. They have no vouchers, you know, overnight have virtually no value. And, and even worse, um, again, these criminals came up with a scheme, probably from, you know, Western thinking here, where these unregulated called voucher investment funds was basically saying, listen, if you invest your 10,000 ruble um, voucher with this investment fund, um, we will keep that money safe and we'll make sure that it's, it's invested and you're gonna make 3% on it or something, right? Well, not one part of these voucher investments fund was legal. It was all criminal driven. Um, although Western investment banks played along and we're gonna get more into how we helped this problem along. <laughs> um, and basically every, anybody who invested in these bogus investment funds lost everything. It was a complete scheme. Uh, and so it, this is the other shady stuff that's going on under the guise of privatization and everything. So that's the first Yeltsin economic program. <laughs> How'd that go? So in 95, um, he comes up with another one. Now, things are going by that last slide stopped at 90, 1993. Hyperinflation was roaring and all these things were going on and crime is still rampant and everything. In the meantime, there's no taxes going into the Russian treasury. And Russia is this close to a government um, debt collapse. And he can't pay soldiers. Soldiers stop getting paid. Pensioners aren't getting pension checks anymore. Teachers. And, and, and he's ready to default on the national debt. So in the five years, four and a half, five years since he took over and tried that first program, things are really going down fast. And like I say, the banks had already been uh, taken over by, I'm just gonna keep calling them oligarchs. So the deal, Yeltsin, he needs money because again, if you can't pay your pensioners and your soldiers and you're about to default, um, you gotta do something. You need money in the treasury and it ain't coming in. There's no mechanism to get it in yet. So you go to the banks, you go to the money guys. And you go to the banks and you say, look, uh, and again, <laughs> if you bank loan the Russian government these billions of dollars so we can start repaying soldiers and pensioners, um, you can hold the biggest, biggest state-owned companies in Russia as collateral. Okay, so one of these oligarchs costs up $5 billion, which the Russian government desperately needs. Um, and now they maybe hold collateral in, oh, some big mining company or some really big, big, big company. And it was about 12 of these kind of export oriented companies that were on the block here, oil, gas, metals, railways, um, and I don't have to tell you what happens next, right? So now the banks, and I, you know, I use the word bank loosely because it's run by these oligarchs and they now hold as collateral all, all the crown jewels of what the Russian economy, even in the old days was based on oil, gas, metals, and all that. Um, now, you know what's gonna happen, right? There's no way the government of Boris Yeltsin is gonna be able to pay back those loans of billions of dollars to the that they made to the government. So what's gonna happen to all those industries? Now the oligarchs, the banks foreclose on all of it and now they own everything <laughs> that's left. And the big stuff, not the little stuff, but the gas fronts of the world. 
the you know the Trans-Siberian Railroad system. I mean, all that stuff. So, um, we have to talk about uh, how this privatization. Um, there is a parliament. There is a thing called the Duma, by the way, in the in the Russian government. It's created when the Soviet Union fell. And it's a parliamentary system. They still call it the Duma. And theoretically, they have to approve these policies that Boris Yeltsin is coming up with. He's not a czar. Well, he kind of is, but he's not supposed to be a czar or an autocrat. He's, he's supposed he's got this representative government or parliamentary system that has to turn his policy initiatives into law and approve them or send them back to him or whatever, the way we kind of do it. Well, they are, they are violently opposed to everything that's going on so far. They don't agree with anything he's done. He, they were the ones that really said, don't do this first, put the laws and institutions in place first. Of course, he ignored that, did this instead. And then when they start making too much noise, he just abolishes the doom, right? Now we are a czar. <laughs> now we are an autocrat, basically. Um, because the deputies in, in the Duma uh, had voted to impeach him and get rid of him. So he just abolishes the whole system, the whole legislative system. Um, and I don't know if you remember this picture, but this is where he actually got some tanks in Moscow and bombed the parliament or put a bunch of, you know, artillery into the, into the Duma's offices in downtown. Moscow. And that was really the, the brief lifetime of, of the democratic experiment in Russia with the, with the legislative body, because he just did that when, he, when, they, when they wanted to kick him out, he did that. So anyway, that was, you know. So this is what we talked about where, um, in order to get money in the treasury and pay off the pensioners and all that, again, he secretly assembles uh, the oligarchs, industrialists who agreed. And they had all agreed ahead of time. This was supposed to be an auction, quote unquote, an auction too, but it wasn't. Um, they had prearranged which oligarch would get which industry. They sat around a table and said, okay, well, who wants railroads? Okay, we'll give you railroads and we'll give you the uh, you know, the TV media stuff, you know, they, they just divvied it all up behind closed doors and what price they would have to pay. Um, but to the outside world and to the Russian population, these are auctions again. They're not, there's never been really an auction. Um, and every one of these, you know, oligarch financiers end up, like we do, I said this before, they're, these insider auctions are buying up these gigantic industries 10% of their actual market worth. And of course, the loans are never paid and therefore they take ownership of all this stuff. So you see where the oligarchs are now running the table here. So we have to talk about Harvard. I know this sounds like, why would we talk about Harvard? But I have to look at my notes a little bit because it's such an ridiculous story. So um, well, Putin is coming up with these programs. He's got a couple of young guys that are economists. They're in their low, their thirties. They'd read, they'd never been to a, a business school in the West. The only thing they knew about Western finance or economic things was reading textbooks. And so uh, they needed help and they got help from, um, it's called uh, USAID, you've probably heard of this. It's a government agency, US Agency for International Development. Uh, they make investments all over the world. They have for de decades and decades um, to take, um, you know, young democracies and, you know, young, co you know, young countries trying to put economic uh, systems in place. We'd ship it, the a a USAID would go over with experts. And they, uh, in turn, gave these huge contracts to um, 
The Harvard Institute for International Development, which is part of Harvard, the school, Harvard. And Harvard was kind of well placed because this is a name you're gonna remember. Larry Summers, y'all know who Larry Summers is? He's still interviewed. I see him interviewed on TV all the time, right? He was the one saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, Biden's going to kick off inflation too much. If he does it. Anyway, so Larry Summers has been around a long time. And at the time he was uh, a Harvard economic professor. And he was really in tight with the, uh, with Bill Clinton, the Clinton administration. And uh, so USAID, the government agency, funneled a whole bunch of money. I think, let's see, about... $300 million in USAID grants went to the Harvard Institute for International Development. Makes sense. I mean, Harvard Business School is legendary. And you know, if you want to help out Russia with their move to capitalism, who better to send on airplanes than Harvard Business School experts? I mean, it makes sense, I guess, right? Uh, so if the money didn't go to Harvard, it went to the six big accounting firms you know, that, that we have in this country. They also help out putting investment banking in place and all that. All these outfits from the West are looking with, licking their chops at the opportunities here. So, uh, one, I'll just go to the short strokes of this, but um, first of all, the Harvard uh, managers actually pushed the idea with the Elson that he ought to go fast and not slow. Um, but then they did some stuff that got him into real trouble. The, the main uh, leader of, of the Harvard group going to, you know, that went to Russia uh, helped us helped his girlfriend set up mutual, a mutual fund in Russia. Okay, you smell what's coming here? Um, and remember that thing we just call, I call, call it a loan for share, where both, uh, uh, Putin, I'm mean, sorry, uh, Yeltsin needed all the money in the treasury, so he auctioned off the biggest industries to the oligarchs. Um, well, it didn't just go to the oligarchs. Um, George Soros became one of the largest in shareholders in uh, Russia's biggest steel mill. And uh, as well as uh, some other big bond firm firms that were created there. Anyway, a, a lot of the accounting firms in America and others uh, and Harvard people that were sworn to not take advantage of the situation. Uh, well, bottom line is in, in September 2000, the US government sued Harvard for fraud, breach of contract, making false claims. And they had defrauded the US government for at least $40 million. And the government under something called the False Claims Act wanted three times the damages because of a lot of very shady stuff that Harvard set up like girlfriends owning mutual funds in Russia. And there's books written about, well, like that's the best one probably how, again, this is one of these opportunities where maybe had we had some scrupulous Americans <laughs> um, on the ground there helping do this right. Um, for example, the Harvard guys uh, are the ones that, um, they didn't advocate that Yeltsin dismiss the Duma, the, the legislature, but they made it worse because a lot of the policies that the Duma would not approve would be um, executive orders, decrees from Yeltsin's office. Like, we're gonna do this and the hell with the Duma. Well, the Harvard guys wrote every one of those executive orders and those decrees that were specifically designed to uh, bypass the legislative body to do that. Those are Harvard guys. They penned all those executive orders. So I don't know. I had this fantasy about Harvard Business School that kind of got blown up in this story. But it's just, 
it's just one of those um it, it was an opportunity i mean maybe if we'd done that right and we didn't have some brack going on on our side of this equation things would have come out different well now we're in a position where um oligarchs are basically in charge of any any enter enterprise worth anything little ones big ones banks oil companies everything and but again, it, they're all one way or another kind of criminal enterprises, and they need to protect themselves from other oligarchs who have their own criminal enterprises. So they actually start setting up their own security, little private armies that would protect them and their folks. And again, there's a whole bunch of unemployed ex-Soviet security service folks running around with nothing to do, KGB folks and military folks unemployed. And, being hired now by the oligarchs to protect. Now the oligarchs are buying protection from other oligarchs. Uh, it's just way higher scale now. And the most, maybe the most lucrative thing to buy if it wasn't for oil and gas was um, this new thing in Russia, which was a brand new thing called the mass media, TV stations, nationwide TV, which had never existed really before that. And, um, Boris Berezovsky, if you've heard that name, really uh, gained control over most of the televised media. And, and, and oh yeah, the you know Aeroflot, the the, 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 the Russian uh, airline, you know, commercial airline company. And uh, Michael Kordovsky, who's a great example of how these guys came from nothing to owning the country. Back in the late 80s, Michael Kodorowski um, was a young communist, like I say here, and his deal was, this is probably in 87 or so, 88, 89. He started a business of smuggling personal computers into the old Soviet Union, um, which he could, he would buy in the West and uh, illegally import into Russia and then sell them at great profits. Uh, but he's just a, a 26 year old kid who knows a lot about computers. He was a computer programmer in the early days in some Soviet company or enterprise or, you know. but he's probably one of the most innovative entrepreneurs in the whole story because, you know, by, you know, well, mid '90s, he now owns the Yukos Oil Company, seventy-eight percent stake of it. And Yukos, if Gazprom's the biggest gas company, Yukos is the biggest crude oil company. He buys it for three hundred fifty million dollars. Two years later, its value is nine billion dollars. So now, well, he goes, Michael Kodorowski goes from a smuggler of PCs. In a few years, he buys Yukos oil for nothing, and now he's worth $9 billion a few years later. I mean, that's kind of the how it works story. I think of how these guys played the system. I mean, he was a genius kid, and, you know, and Berezovsky was basically the same thing. Um, he was a toy maker, and he made those little rubber ducks. Now he owns media, TV media in, in, in the Russian Republic. But their day's coming. They think they're gonna come out okay on this, <laughs> but they're not. So uh, by 1996, uh, the whole system has collapsed again. Um, and the IMF tries to bail out Russia with a $10, $10 billion loan to support, I love this, uh, Russia's free market reforms. <laughs> sure, uh, okay. And all that money that came from the IMF was actually used to convert to convert oligarchs rubles into dollars, which all found their way outside of Russia. Every dollar these guys make has to be is just by default moved, laundered outside of Russia. None of it stays in the country. Russia defaults on its debt in '98, despite all this other stuff that had happened. And it was a complete collapse of the system. And I, I think we were in the West, we were still celebrating the end of the Cold War. I don't think we really cared or knew what the hell was going on in Russia in the 90s, late 90s. 
but it was worse than any great depression you want to talk about but nobody seemed to i didn't know about but inflation still ridiculous poverty has gone to 40 percent from two percent again pension checks military factories closed the whole system collapses farms too um and people are starving literally starving to death on the streets and yet in the mid 90s moscow had more mercedes 600 cars than all of europe combined and the Mercedes 600 is like the monster, biggest, baddest Mercedes Benz you could buy at the time. And they're everywhere. And they're rolling past people that are starving on the sidewalks. I mean, this is, this is 1996. So Now it's 96. In 1996, Boris Yeltsin is up for re-election. I don't have to tell you that his approval rating is about 3%. I mean, it was, it was a joke. He was, um, so he wins the election. You know how he wins the election? He wins the election in 96 because one of the quid pro quo quid pro quos he strikes with, particularly Berezovsky, who runs media, is Berezovsky says, okay, I'll give your government, I forget how many billion dollars. And in return, I will support your reelection re for president when it comes up in 96. And that's exactly what he does. Him and a couple other guys, uh, uh, un, you know, create the first real Blitzkrieg TV based media event supporting Yeltsin's re election in 96. And it totally works. He goes from 3% approval to winning the election because of how the media was just hammering. You know, it, it was really impressive. <laughs> so, um, but by 1999, um, Yeltsin's health is really failing, and they need a success. Everybody knows, including Yeltsin, because by the way, Yeltsin's family is completely complicit in all this corruption. They are shoveling billions of dollars. The family, daughters, daughters-in-law, sons-in-law, are sho shoveling all kinds of money. They're they're taking big pieces of all the action, and they're putting it in Swiss bank accounts and all that too. So Yeltsin has his own criminal problem. Uh, and so he picks the guy that um, seemed the, the most gray, you know, guy you could ever pick to replace him as, well, I think it was actually his prime minister because Yeltsin's plan was he was going to resign early from his presidency. And Yeltsin picks Actually, Berezovsky picks Putin. Remember, every, the, the, the oligarchs are running the country in every possible way. So they are picking ministers in the cabinet. They are picking the government, anybody who's in the government, their people. And Berezovsky, who gave the re-election to Yeltsin because of all the media bullets he did on his behalf is really the guy that picked out Boris Yeltsin. And, and these are the bullet, these bullet things are why the profile at the time of Vladimir Putin was so uh, attractive to the oligarchs. I mean, Yeltsin's nothing. There is no, you know, the oligarchs are picking in. I mean, they run the country completely end to end now. And Putin is perceived as, the, and they're kind of, it's a, I forget the Russian term, but he's just a briefcase carrier. carrier. He's, a, he's a bureaucrat. He's a gray little man. Um, he was the uh, deputy mayor of St. Petersburg for years, um, where he really learned the mafia trade, which was really going big time in St. Petersburg at the time. Um, but he's perceived as someone who's loyal. He understands the bureaucracy. Uh, he keeps his head down, carries his little briefcase, and he's just got this impeccable, like I say, record for loyalty and bureaucratic efficiency. 
And he proved himself because of the St. Petersburg thing. Um, when uh, a Russian attorney general started looking into Yeltsin's corruption and his family's corruption, um, Putin, when he, you know, in, in 1999, assumed the presidency when Yeltsin resigned early. First thing Putin does as president now is pardon Boris Yeltsin and his family. Does this sound familiar? Pardoning? Um, and now the GDP of the Russian Republic is less than the Netherlands. And by the way, the, the first Chechen war was going on. Remember, Gorbachev actually started that. And the Red Army got their asses kicked by this ragtag group of Islamic insurgents in Chechnya. And the whatever was left of the Red Army, now it wasn't called that anymore, kind of limps back in defeat to Russia. Um, so in May 2000, Vladimir Putin is elected president. Handpicked by the oligarchs because he is no threat to us. Well, guess what? They don't know this guy. They have no idea who they just put in power. In 2005, remember Mikhail Godorovsky? He's the guy that owns Yukos Oil, the biggest oil company in, 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 in Russia. The guy that smuggled in the PCs and everything. Um, Khodorovsky is starting to smell that this Putin guy is going to be trouble. And he doesn't like kind of what he's doing. And he's looking very corrupt and, and everything, really early Putin is. So Khodorovsky is in the press, on media, any, anybody who'll listen is saying really bad things about Vladimir Putin. Hey, I, I'm, I'm starting, we're, we're starting to get our head around this guy. He's, he's, he's bad news. Putin, who was put in power by Godorovsky and Berezovsky, those two guys really picked him and put him as president. Putin betrays and jails Khodorovsky for a five-year sentence and exiles Berezovsky. Remember, he's the guy that runs all the TV media who got Yeltsin reelected and exiles Berezovsky and he takes off for London and Putin arrests and exiles other oligarchs, all of whom supported Putin's election to president, <laughs> and he seizes all their assets. So Khodorovsky is now sitting in jail with a nine-year prison sentence because he was, for Putin, from Putin's perspective, he was going to be troubled for where Putin wanted to go, and he seizes all of Khodorovsky's assets, including the $9 billion Yukos oil company is now Vladimir Putin's oil company. So if anybody has any illusions about Vladimir Putin anymore, <laughs> I mean, why did, you know, and we still thought for years, years and years after this that we could do deals with this guy and negotiate with this guy. I'm sorry, I don't know how we ever, did that. So he seized all of their assets for himself, not for Russia. Well, there's no difference. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's the thing. I mean, you tell me the difference between up to now, there's been, again, no money flowing into the Russian treasury. That's why they defaulted and people are starving. Well, Putin's just riding the train, right? I mean, he runs the government and he does, though. Uh, or the ones that weren't exiled or fled the country with all their money, uh, insist that they start paying taxes because Putin does have a treasury that's empty and he, he needs to fix that or otherwise he'll, he'll be in trouble. And he tries to get these guys to start put, you know, you know, ban you know stashing their money in, in, in overseas bank accounts. But the main thing he strikes with them to let the, the ones that he didn't imprison or exile, the ones that remained were, you guys can pretty much do anything you want but stay out of politics. Do not put one toe into my, into my world of running the government, my political mission as president. Khodorovsky did that. 
Khodorkovsky had started to challenge Putin politically, threatening him. He ends up in jail for nine years. And so the deal with the oligarchs is pretty much do what you do. I do need some taxes, so you guys have to pay some taxes now. But I'll let you do your thing, but stay the hell out of politics and we'll be all good. Now, now he has the tables have turned, right? So now Putin is, is issuing conditions and orders to the oligarchs if they want to stay doing their business in Russia. And one of the first things he does, Putin does, is to <coughs> replace their high level managers in these companies and industries with his ex KGB allies from St. Petersburg, right? Including the Russian Orthodox Church, which is to this day, the patriarch of the Moscow Russian Orthodox Church is an ex-KGB guy that Putin knew in the, you know, in the old days of St. Petersburg. Um, but a whole bunch of the oligarchs take, now this is the first generation of, there's actually another generation of oligarchs that are like kind of now, but this is the first one. So I hope this makes sense because it's kind of a convoluted, story about um, you know the, 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 the second time reforms were made without laws and the criminal enterprise eventually takes over the country and, and bring a guy in like Putin who betrays them all. <laughs> I mean, if you put it into one sentence, I guess that's one sentence. Is that? At this point, is Putin in fact making appeals to financial stability of people who are not oligarchs. And so is there in fact a reduction of poverty during this period under yes. Putin? Yes, in fact, when we get into Putin next week, mm -hmm. Putin became a hero because he reduced poverty from 40% of the population back down to the single digits today. Mm -hmm. He, he, in a so cloud. he's now got getting taxes. Yeah. So the question is, yeah. what is he doing? And not only is he paying the soldiers, he's giving them raises. He is he is becoming the most popular. His popularity, which is still, if you believe whatever passes for a poll in Russia, if, if it's real at all, a lot of that began through how he, in in just a few years, like 20, 2003 or four. He had completely turned this desperate. He actually built a state. Yes. With... Yeah. 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 And and he he became and he's still a hero for for his, um, you, you know, I mean pensioners got checks, his soldiers got paid, and, and things improved, and he improved industries. I mean, he really turned it around. Like three years, he took this pile and turned it into a really pretty competitive economy profoundly corrupt and based on a kind of the biggest pyramid scheme. He's at the top and everybody is, is there to serve him at his whim. But still, yeah, you're he absolutely- He learned something as being an efficient bureaucrat. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And he still totally is, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of next week, we'll start right there. I love this. This is probably the best quote I've ever read in this, in this kind of story. In the 90s, the word Russian and gangster were synonymous. When Putin ascended to the Kremlin, the heir of the gangster died. Putin's cronies took over our organized crime themselves. There was no way the hoodlums could compete. <laughs> I just love that quote. Like, and, and that's a great book if you want uh, that, that, uh, that book. Nothing is true and everything is possible. Uh, if you want to read a book about this time frame and this crazy culture that has come out of those years and, and now the Russia we see today, I recommend that, that book. So, okay, maybe a little opportunities lost thing here. In the beginning of this, forget all the oligarchs and all the crap, just imagine you're a regular like a Russian citizen again, living through this and you've lived through communism, you lived through the fall of Soviet Union, you've been through all that. And you get these reformers and you get Yeltsin and you get all this talk of democracy and capitalism in the West, economics and all that. It's like what they what the Russian person on the street imagined 
or were promised and what they got. They didn't get a diversified market economy. They got this gangster capitalism, uh, kleptocracy. Uh, they wanted political freedoms. They absolutely did not get that. They had what I think the term we're using now for people like Orban in, in, in Hungary is an illiberal democracy. Right, they have a government and they have representatives, but it's illiberal, it's not free. Civil rights or whatever you know the guy says they are today. And what they really wanted, um, because you gotta remember that our attitude during those years was pretty uh, I don't know what's the right word, uh, arrogant <laughs> with a capital A. I mean, we were just so pleased with the with with the collapse of this whole enemy, or you know existential enemy of ours and the more they suffered the better it was i mean i remember thinking that way i mean but what they wanted was some co-equal status with the west some respect and we gave them nothing but humiliation and we then you know we'll, we talk about nato in a minute the same kind of thing happened there we were and boy does putin play on that theme of the West disrespecting and minimalizing Russia and its people and its culture and everything. And he's kind of got a point. Uh, you know, they've been sanctioned off, off and on. And it's really bad now, of course, but they thought they'd get world stock supermarkets. Well, they probably, they might've, you know, things had been different, but we started piling sanctions on them and guess who that hurts? Uh, so anyway, that's kind of the list of just ama it makes you wonder what could have been. So if you think about our role in some of this, um, they wanted and just about big back in that time for full membership in NATO and the EU. And for probably good reasons, uh, we weren't ready to grant that to this virtually a failed state of, of you know, Russia defaulting on their national debt and all the rest of it. So we kind of gave them some kind of second tier status to these things where they could be um, uh, sort of applying for these, for, for membership in these things. But the, the list of prerequisites to actually be accepted into the EU or, or NATO were totally not within reach yet. But it just kind of amplified that Western attitude of you guys are not worth, <laughs> you're not worthy, you're just not worthy yet. And from what I've read, I mean, there were the, some of those conditions were you had to accept that the US was the global leader, period, the end, full stop. We lead the world and you will never question us again or threaten us again. Uh, that's a that's a condition that I wouldn't live through or live with. I don't know if I would. I don't know how I'd feel about that. And then, of course, Clinton '96. Um, he pursues this rapid NATO expansion thing with all the old uh, Iron Curtain countries. And just to kind of remind us who they are: uh, Poland, Czechos. You know, you know, right. And of course, Ukraine, Belarus, they're not, they're not anywhere near this yet. They still are independent countries now, but they're not courting or being courted by NATO or the EU or anything like that. Yeah, we're still, that's a new, I don't know how that's gonna come out either. <laughs> um, and of course, we love to give them all these self-serving lectures about free markets and human rights and democracy. We just have this arrogant sort of, well, if your old government autocracy collapses, um, the way the natural order of the universe works is you're going to respect human rights and democracy and free markets. That's how we think. We've been trained to think that way since the uh, age of reason, I mean, back in the, you know, the 19th century or whatever. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, if you read some of the books by Timothy Snyder, somebody sent me, Jack? Where's Jack? He left. Um, he's, uh, uh, there's some, sort of this arrogance that we have about when states fail, and in maybe the Iraq war, and they start putting their thumbs in ink saying they voted, that somehow they're going to turn into a democracy. 
And we just assume that, and it's not true. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Anyway. And as we saw with Harvard and a whole bunch of our big accounting firms, we were pretty complicit in, in some of the stuff that led to the bad stuff in the privatization schemes of the 90s. We were not helpful. And then, I don't know, there's a couple of things about George Bush. Um, he abandons the ABM Treaty. Uh, Putin had given him an air base when we were in our own Afghan war. And it was a loan from Putin and Russia to George Bush, this really critical air base in Kyrgyzstan. And instead of sort of recognizing that's really Russia's to give, um, George Bush just annexed it, annexed it and made it ours. It just pissed them off, something terrible, the Russians and Putin. Anyway, so, but things were interesting in terms of what Putin and our guys uh, were trying to do. So we know that after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine inherited 2000 nuclear warheads on ICBMs and had no, all the people, Red Army that, that managed them were long gone. So uh, Yeltsin agrees to, for the US to pay the bill to come in and dismantle all those warheads and missiles. And Russia agrees to convert all the nuclear material in those warheads. I forget the term for reprocessing nuclear material so it's not weaponized. It's now something you can use in nuclear electricity reactors and electrical plants. And so we got, you know, reprocessed warhead nuclear material, and we are still using that material in our own US-based nuclear power generation stations. So that was a pretty good deal for everybody, because then the Ukraine didn't have to worry about all those nukes in the ground everywhere in Ukraine. Uh, and that second tier thing, like I said, we wouldn't let them get into NATO and the EU yet. There were all these conditions. What they created was this thing called Partnership for Peace, which all those ex Warsaw Pact nations, uh, including the Russian Republic itself, were, could join this Partnership for Peace, which is like an auxiliary, um, you know, uh, training wheels thing. <laughs> for countries that eventually wanted to be considered for entry into, into NATO. Uh, and the Budapest Memorandum, I still hear about that now because Russia, UK, UK, United States, China, France, all agreed to respect the sovereign and existing borders of the Ukraine, which Putin now says, well, I didn't agree to that. <laughs> well, Russia agreed to that and China agreed to that. And of course, China doesn't, care a whit about Putin's, you know, notion of just, you know, invading Ukraine and annexing whatever he wants to take. Um, and then the, the last one is kind of another Ukrainian thing. So remember where, when the Ukraine became an independent country, uh, the Ukraine had the Russian army's most or Navy's most significant piece of land, which is uh, the Crimea. So now Russian, so the, the, a deal was made between Yeltsin's Russia and the Ukrainians, where the Russian, the old Russian fleet, uh, you know, naval fleet was partitioned, where Russia got 81% of it and Ukraine got 18% of the warships and the infrastructure. And Russia agreed to pay $525 million as compensation um, for, allow, for the Ukrainians allowing them to still put the Russian Navy there. Um, and Russia would have to pay $90 million a year, I think, uh, to lease those bases um, in the Crimea. Again, owned by, you know, most important piece of land in terms of Russian military, naval for sure, but the Ukrainians have the right to now rent it out to the Russians, which pissed off Putin something awful, because he thinks it's his anyway. But the deal 
for leasing Crimea for, for the bases in the Crimea expri expired in 2017. So Russia hasn't paid any rent for, for all their naval bases. So instead of that, knowing that that was coming, that's when Putin annexed the whole Crimean Peninsula with the naval bases in 2014 and just took it. Now it's not part of Ukraine at all. So, and I think that's it. So I just wanted to give you two books um, to think about. First, that one on the left, which I already kind of talked about, which is uh, really interesting about how how culture works in today's Putin-based post-collapse world in, in, in Russia. Really interesting book, particularly all the media. How Putin and his guys have mastered mass media way better than, than we do it. <laughs> in terms of crafting messages for the Russian people to consume. And it's just fascinating reading to see how their notion of media, 24 seven media propaganda is created. And it's really, really interesting. So that's a good book. And then this is gonna come up more next week, uh, Red Notice. So if you've heard of Bill Browder, anybody? I mean, he, he gets interviewed every so often. He wrote a book. He um, about, I don't know, eight years ago. He was one of those early capitalists when, Putin, when, when uh, Yeltsin was doing his privatization schemes that came in as a, like a big uh, uh, equity firm looking to make a fortune out of this chaos going on in Russia. And uh, it's, it led to a a really internationally famous murder of one of his employees who uncovered all this graft and, and Putin had him killed. But anyway, and then Bill Broder was, um, you know what Red Notice is? That's when the uh, Interpol International Police, if they issue a Red Notice against you, that means you can be arrested in any country in the world. There's no extradition or something. Red Notice means you can just be who, whichever company, whichever country gets approved a red notice against you means if you travel, you can be arrested anytime, anywhere, no matter what. So that's, and he's had that over his head. And another really good book on the insight of what went on behind the scenes during those years. So, so next year, I'm sorry, next year, next week, we will, uh, feels like next year at this point, but next week we, we will just get right into what uh, Kathy was bringing up really which is how when Putin gained control, um, put the oligarchs in their place and went about um, rebuilding the economy and, and everything else. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good story. So that's it, any questions? <laughs> Did I keep it under six hours? <laughs> Probably not. I, I never. I, I kind of gave up on that idea. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, it was interesting that when the oligarchs were in such power, were they organized or was it just a, I mean, did they meet and decide how they're going to do this or, or was there a leader amongst them or did they just, depending on who was in the office? Well, the two that I highlighted there, Kodorowski and Berzo, they, they were the first among equals. Okay. I mean, they owned. But they were operating independently from the other oligarchs. Well, but they collaborated on the selection of Putin to replace Yeltsin. Two of them did. There were two of them did. Um, and I don't think it was like that scene from uh, The Godfather, where you know Corleone brings all the heads of the six the family, or the five yeah. families yeah. together in that really cool room with the big locomotive tower. Um, and you know, and hammers out a deal. We're not going. We're going to agree that you have the drugs. You know, I'll take the prostitution. So the, <laughs> you know, the, the most wealthy of the oligarchs kind of drove the show. Well, and again, I mean, the entire Russian economy was and still is based on oil, and natural gas, and minerals. It's never moved from that. I mean, you know, I mean, it's one thing is Putin has failed miserably at is diversifying his economy into other things. About the only other thing he's created is a is is you know, this army of hackers that can take down your electrical system anytime they want. But he hasn't diversified, you know, it's still oil, gas, and minerals. Is it fair to say and, and those are the guys that ran the show then? When I was over there, there was a 
apparently a wealthy class and a poor and there's virtually no middle class in Russia. Is that, is that no, not really. I mean, there is a, the middle class in, in the early days, and it's one of those things, you know, that you did very early. You really did create what we would all agree to as a middle class. Um, now, it was, you know, still driven by sort of a criminal element there. But yeah, no, there is a, a, a there is a middle class, and there never was before, and, and that's one of the things you've got to put in Putin's good column, maybe. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to just ask this, but uh, when did Russia, Russia bought Stillwater Mine here in Montana? <laughs> yeah, I heard that too. I don't know. <laughs> well, I heard that. I think it's true because yeah, Senator yeah. Burns was pushing that. I remember that. Wait, no, I, know. Yeah. I forgot when that was, and I'm hoping all this bad history didn't have anything to do with the dead mind. Did it? Well, there, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all I know, and I don't know really, but, but is that any company big enough and rich enough to buy a mining company outside of the country isn't doing it completely independently. Right, it's going through you know, the, the you know Putin's bureaucracy at some level. I don't know how, but nothing like that could happen without Putin's approval. It just couldn't happen. But I mean, all those things are done through his central apparatus. So if that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think it, it doesn't necessarily sound corrupt. I mean, it sounds like he, that they had assets that we did. I don't know how that works, but it's true. Like, well, I, I, I heard that too. I forgot when the red, when the miners. Bought by the Russians, and is it still owned by the Russians? Yeah. Yeah. South Africa. South Africa. Mm -hmm. South Africa now? Yeah. Still veining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and I, I think now, with all these sanctions in place, I don't think that could ever happen again. You're never going to have a Russian company the way they're all sanctioned. They can't do business with the West anymore like that since the Ukrainian invasion. I mean, yeah. recent recent history, but that, that's yeah. not on the table anymore. So, but if, you know, that back, it wasn't that long ago that, uh, you know, we were still negotiating with Putin on a business level, all, all kinds of levels, because guys like George W. Bush and his father and uh, uh, well, every one of our, all of our presidents think they can Come up with some win win negotiated solution to our problems with Vladimir Putin. And it's absolutely nonsense, but we keep trying. I don't think we're going to try anymore. <laughs> I think, I think we, but now we went, went, now we everybody's going to go now, now we really know what that guy's about. Well, hell, we know exactly what he was about back in 1998. I mean, he was clear as a bell. He, he just betrayed all the people that helped him. And why wasn't there? It's amoral. He is an amoral with that. Hmm? Why wasn't there a coup at that point by the foreman? He threw him in jail. I mean, he's still running. I mean, Putin. He had control of the army. He had control of the army, the secret police, the government. Only the government could show up at Mikhail Khodorovsky's, you know, fancy mansion one day and arrest him, slap him in the iron, and throw him in prison. I mean, what army, well, who's going to save you? Putin's. I mean, he went from nothing to, he still had those powers. He was president of the country. And he had all his ex, ex KGB guys everywhere now inserted inside of all the institutions and all the ministries and most of the companies. And those were all his guys. So, I mean, and this, this is this great little briefcase carrier that everybody says. <laughs> uh, <he's cool. laughs> Okay, guys, well, again, next week it will be about food. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so I have an interesting little uh, birthday today. Oh, so the last, oh, I don't know, several days, maybe uh, a week. Yeah, you know, we've always had pictures going for them with these pictures. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, that's not too much. Too much. You know, I do hear them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wouldn't see them very often. You know, maybe once a month I see them. Or, 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 or. And then about a week ago, 
Look this down there. I see the male and the female standing together on a log. I've never seen it together like that. And then I go back in the afternoon and they be on the log. And I know what's going on here that that embankment that goes down to the creek on the stream. That's exactly where the creatures go their nests. They bore into the vertical embankments and they create a tunnel, right? And they put their nests three or four feet inside. They dig it out and there's a tunnel and there's a nest for them. And the only thing I can think of is they have to build a nest. Yeah. Underneath, underneath, yeah, so you look right under your house. Just right there, when you're looking at the map, that's like 20 foot. And even if you look at the map, there's the sun flying around. And so, of course, I put my blind down this time. And I'm going to try to see. I've been, I, this is like a dream come true, right? They're nesting right there. You know, 20 feet. Yeah, you really have to figure out how to get it on the other side. Yeah, of the I know. So I don't want to see the nest, but I have to go across right. the street to see it. You're going to have to put on your way. Or I could. You know, somehow hang a trail can. <laughs> well, actually, I, that's what immediately occurred to me. You can put a trail can there. I know. But I think there's going to be some good photo opportunities. That's a fast I want to see a juvenile. I want to see him come in and get the fish. So you never know. Sounds great. You know, I um, we used to do to kind of not push back or at least to, to let it be internal. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, there's this whole theme of the, the West just looked down on and they didn't take them seriously. And, and on the other hand, everybody thinking they could make a deal and, and, and yeah. trying desperately to bring them into the western fold and western companies investing big money in yeah. russia uh and that being promoted uh <clears throat> Yeah, uh, they're, they're invited to the G7, you know, uh, as a partner. Yeah, you know, and yeah, true. So, I mean, that's what they were saying. That's the way, I mean, Russia, 